Our guest is a man who was as busy as anybody during the great radio days and the days that followed as well. He's Dick Beals, and we're glad to be here with you today. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. You had a, uh, a very long career in what we call the golden age of radio. About when did it start? It started for me on the campus of Michigan State University. It was Michigan State College then, although we were a university. Mm -hmm. That was uh, fall of 1945 when Michigan State, thanks to the general manager of the radio station, convinced me that I'd be better off being a radio actor taking children's parts than trying to be a sports announcer and because uh, I didn't sound like a sports announcer. So the training started not in my classes, which were trained, were training me to run a radio station, mm -hmm. but uh, plus the other general college courses. But then they had some radio shows on that campus. One especially was rural school music time, and there was a part of a little 10-year-old boy on that, and I played that for three years. But the direction was so good. Uh, to teach articulation and never running but running and sound your vowels and your consonants and doing live shows every week in front of an audience was just excellent training. That moved me on as a senior to Detroit where I started working the Lone Ranger Green Hornet Challenge, the Yukon shows. Then in uh, December of 51, I decided to drive to Hollywood and make it a try out there and uh, I've been there ever since. Well, let's go back to Detroit for a couple of minutes. You just passed that off so easily. Went to WXYZ in Detroit and worked on the Lone Range of the Green Hornet and then Sergeant Preston, and then now we're in California. Oh, that was a big, that was a big time there. How, how many years were you working on that? I shows? was there about three years, mm -hmm. and talking about a big time, it was just a very scary time because uh -huh. I started, remember, I'm commuting back and forth on a bus from my dormitory at Michigan State getting back in at, at 11.30 at night with an 8 o'clock class the next morning. And uh, I was scared to death because Charles D. Livingston, the director, if you made a minor error on that live network show, you didn't work anymore for maybe three months. Mm. That was the way he punished you. And uh, I was getting my first paycheck doing those shows. But these other people on the show, Raleigh Parker, Ernie Winstanley, uh, they were, that was their living. There were only 10 or 15 of us that did all three of those mm -hmm. shows in the same studio, same director, same writers. And if they made a mistake, they had no income for three months. And so it was so scary knowing that, trying to be a professional radio actor with all my Michigan State training. Mm -hmm. But they were very kind to me, and they really helped me, especially Raleigh Parker, who took me aside and would say, okay, now we're going to do it this way and this way. And uh, uh, it was tremendous training. I didn't realize it until I got to Hollywood. You were always playing the, the youngsters then, the children? Yeah, I played Dan Reed on The Lone Ranger. That was the oldest mm -hmm. part I would take. But there would be a three-year-old little girl or a six-year-old boy and uh, whatever. And I didn't care as long as I got to uh, go down there and do it as part of my training. And then I... When I graduated, I, it was the spring of 49, then I moved to my home in Birmingham, and it was an easy commute mm -hmm. then from Birmingham, just 10 or 15 miles down to the studio. The, uh, the three-month uh, suspension or purgatory or <laughs> whatever it would be, Both. that apply <laughs> applied to everybody yes. on the show? Yes, well, not Brace Beamer, not mm -hmm. John Todd. Mm -hmm. John then was Tonto, and he was 86 years old when we were doing that okay. show, and this is 1940. 9, 50, 51, and he had done Shakespearean acting on mm. Broadway in the 1900s at the turn of the century. And yet he's doing uh, the monosyllabic tanto. I, Kino Sabi, get him up scout. You know. <laughs> but that was a real mm. education. Uh, I didn't realize until I got to California, and with no credits to speak of, I would just put my little 3 by 5 card in front of the directors that would mm. listen to me, and they would see Detroit, Lone Ranger, Green Hornet Challenge, the Yukon, and they said, oh, you worked for him, didn't you? Uh -huh. And I realized, oh, they're not all like Charles D. Livingston. But he gave you a foundation that uh, oh, you probably could Oh, the training. For, uh, anyway. I was scared to death, but the training mm -hmm. I got working with the pros versus the fellow students up at Michigan State was just tremendous. What kind of salary did you get from 
the Lone Ranger broadcast. And so well, forth. all three of them. Uh, we got a check for $54. And in 1949, for me, that was a lot of money. I'd been working for nothing at Michigan State. For uh, any show? If you did a, a Lone yeah, Ranger? Yeah, they're all half-hour network live. So uh, mm -hmm. it was the same check. And really, the Ranger should have been more because we did a 7.30 to 8 show, got off the air, and then uh, we had 30 seconds between 7, 59, 30, mm -hmm. and 8 o'clock, and then we do a rebroadcast, which was uh, sent to Chicago, and that was uh, syndicated. But that mm -hmm. show had fewer commercials, so we had to put maybe 30 to 45 seconds of the script back in that we'd cut, and uh, that was excellent training for me, too. But Raleigh would always sit right next to me and say, okay, now we're going to put this back in and you're in this scene. So remember, mark your script mm -hmm. there and we're going to do this now. It's not cut now. So the script would be written longer in the first place, perhaps for the second show. No, the and script would be written for the first show. And, uh, but we'd always, it was always long. Oh, I see. And mm -hmm. so they'd make cuts. And now we had to put the cuts back in. Now you get out to California, and what was your, that when someone looked at your 3 by 5 card with your credit of the WXYZ and Livingston and all of that stuff on there, what was your first job there? My first job was uh, Dr. Christian. Uh, the assistant director, uh, Neil Reagan, President Reagan's brother, was the director. Uh, but uh, Ted Robertson used to spend a little time in Detroit, so he knew the Lone Ranger people. And... Uh, uh, he gave he was the casting director on that and he gave me a shot and uh he also was nice enough to cast it with the biggest names in Hollywood Ginny Greg Hal March Bob Sweeney John Daner uh it was just tremendous i didn't know who these people mm -hmm. were except i recognized their voices but actors talk and pretty soon uh, the word got around but i had a break uh, an advantage, not a break. Uh, Jeff Silver and Sammy Og were the kids that were pretty busy then. Their voices were starting to change a little bit. Uh -huh. And the directors hated to call the mothers to bring their little boys down. The mother was always there, the stage mother. Now they could hire a college graduate, a professional with good training that could do any age they wanted, boy or girl, mm -hmm. three years old, up to 15 and uh, I got very popular very quickly. I was doing every radio and radio show in town in oh within two months. That's terrific. It was. It was. Uh, it was just so exciting to me to to work with Dick Powell on Sam Spade. I mean, and uh, I'd never heard Howard Duff on Sam Spade. It was Dick Howard Powell Duff. What is Richard Dick Diamond? Richard Diamond. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and again, that was Ginny Gregg that uh -huh. told the director oh, about yeah. me, mm -hmm. and because uh, she worked that original show on Doctor Christian. So you spent a lot of time from the late 40s, now early 50s, in all these radio things. And did you stay with that as opposed to moving on into TV or into some other thing? Now, I know that you, you have provided the voice for one of the most popular TV characters. I guess we could say a character on TV, although it was a commercial character. You were the voice of... Speedy Alka-Seltzer. Yes, I'm still with, it's now owned by Bayer Corporation. Mm -hmm. It was Miles Labs then and Miles Incorporated then Bayer Corporation. Mm -hmm. But I'm still with them. I'm in my 46th year with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I auditioned for that about the same time I was doing that first Dr. Christian show. I, it didn't come to pass for another three months. And we did a test commercial for the West Coast only that November, December, January, then the the sales increased so rapidly that they made a decision to go ahead with that. In the meantime, I was a very busy radio actor, but the minute commercials started, especially doing Speedy, mm -hmm. uh, only the people in the industry knew who was doing the voice. It was kept very quiet, and that was my wish, too. But all of a sudden, I was doing all the commercials. I started doing Oscar Meyer. Uh, then the Campbell Soup Kids. I did the both the little boy and the little girl. And uh, then radio continued, occasionally a cartoon at Disney's or Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. But mainly it was the, the new thing on the street called a television commercial and a product spokesman. Now, not all of them, I was not a, a 
product spokesman except for Alka-Seltzer and for Oscar Mayer. Campbell's Soup kids were really not the spokesman for the product as it was with Speedy. Speedy was actually the product spokesman and it was the first ever product spokesman in the industry and it started something very much brand new but it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing until uh, late 50s, early 60s, and that's when they figured out how to make cartoons with less expense. And we started the Saturday morning cartoons with the Funny mm -hmm. Company, and then Roger Ramjet, that followed immediately, and Davy and Goliath started, and I was doing all of those. So you were really pretty busy. Yeah, the commercials were mm -hmm. a big thing, and so were all the cartoon shows. And then in 58... Hanna Barbera formed their Joe Hanna, Joe, Bill Hanna, and Joe Barbera formed their own company. They had been with MGM and uh, with Tom and Jerry, and they formed their own company. And the first sponsor for the Flintstones was Alka Seltzer, and my commercials were on there. And so I got to know Joe and Bill pretty good, and I'm still working at Hanna Barbera. Well, how many of these Alka Seltzer commercials have you done? I we guess have you, you uh, 200 and 231, I think. 231. And they're still doing some of these? They still use me mainly mm -hmm. for personal appearances and, and oh, giving uh, commencement addresses mm -hmm. and uh, speaking to students, and uh, which I do at Michigan State every year, uh, but also going out and speaking at conventions and uh, uh, motivational speaking seminars, things like that. You, If you had uh, started a little bit earlier than... From your college days, you might have become uh, Johnny, the uh, spokesman for Philip Morris. Huh? I would never have done that. Uh, mm -hmm. That came out when I was in kindergarten, uh, mm -hmm. back in the Depression days. But that was one of the reasons that I went to Michigan State, to become a professional. I thought I was going to be a professional mm -hmm. announcer mm -hmm. or a sports announcer. But uh, I never wanted to do that, put on a costume and parade around. Uh, if I couldn't be a professional businessman, I just wouldn't mm -hmm. play. And uh, so I went to Michigan State to become a professional actor and announcer, actor, turned into an actor, but I would never have done that. Today I wouldn't do it. I just refuse. Did you ever have any recurring roles on a, on a radio show as a, uh, as a youngster or a, a teenage boy or perhaps? No, uh, they were all different. Uh, I did maybe a hundred gun smokes and mm -hmm. I was a different I someone told me the other day that Yorkie was a character I did a couple times but I don't even remember doing it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but no the, every every time you got a call for a, a show you had no idea what you're going to do until you got there well you did some suspense I believe and many suspense shows yeah. but that was all different a yeah. lot of the CBS stuff uh, in the in the 50s where they were turning mm -hmm. out really good Good quality, uh, but radio. the script I have right here, I, mm -hmm. I did a lot of the kids' parts on the Fear McGee and Molly. Mm -hmm. I ended up doing a lot of Doctor Christians, a lot of Railroad Hours, Cisco Kid, Wild Bill Hickok. Mm -hmm. We're in the studio here. Yeah. We're uh, Ray Erlenborn is deciding he's going <laughs> to talk a little bit. <laughs> we, we yeah we're in a we're in a studio where we're chatting with uh, Dick Beals and uh, there's about to be another radio reenactment coming up uh, later today. Well we so we have time. We got a couple of seconds for this. Anyway you uh, you have you worked on any other venues? Have you been on the stage? Did you ever do anything on the stage? No, I didn't like stage either. Mm -hmm. What I've finally been doing now that I'm enjoying oh, more than anything in the world is play-by-play -play baseball. I'm finally my sports announcer I've always wanted to do. And where are you doing this? It, on the, in the California League. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Class A farm team. The Bakersfield Dodgers and uh, Lake Elsinore Storm, which is the California Angels. But I'm finally doing what I've wanted to do all my life, which is play-by-play -play baseball. When you said earlier in our conversation that the, the, uh, the people at Michigan State said, no, you should be an actor instead of sports announcer, and then you said, okay, I'll do this, it seemed like that, was, that you accepted that so readily, at least in our conversation, and yet it was something you had wanted to do for a long time. But I was taught to listen to adults. Uh, that's the way I was brought up, and when an adult tells you something, you believe it. And in my book, I call them angel voices, the right person mm -hmm. at the right time to give you guidance or direction. And Dr. Robert J. Coleman, the station manager at WXYZ, had been in the business since 1924 when it started. 
And when he tells me something, I believe him. And he says, hey, we got a show here. We'd like you to audition for it. And a 10-year-old little boy. And, and uh, fine. Uh, if someone told me to do something, I did it. Uh, take direction willingly is a major part of the speech I give. And uh, I just did what he told me to do. And, and he was right. I never questioned what an adult said. I figured this man knows more than I do. And he was taking my best interest at heart. And uh, he's been my hero. Uh, Dr. Robert J. Coleman, bless his heart, he's been gone a long time, but he started me off in the right direction. Well, I think that's a uh, taking direction willingly is an important line to learn through life. I mean, not just talking about acting, talking about a lot of things. Someone's suggesting something to you. Uh, take it willingly. That's why at all commencement addresses at all talks before advertising classes, marketing classes, PR classes, take direction willingly because there's the youngsters today want to contradict everything you say, want to argue about everything you say, and I'm not going to do what he says. Who's he? Mm -hmm. But that isn't the way you're brought up during the Depression and where you have no money and the only thing that was going for you was your mother and dad to be able to say or to hear neighbors say, Oh, those Beals children, they could take them anywhere. Uh -huh. That was the highest compliment you could pay sure. any family during the Depression. They could take those children anywhere. And with that, that was the best thing you could hear. You had no money. You had no prestige. Take the children anywhere means you did what you were told. You were disciplined. Mm -hmm. And today, if a kid doesn't get his way, he starts crying. My mother could have told me to sit right here in this chair I'll be back in three hours. Don't move. I would have sat here for three hours not moving, but not today. The kids start to cry if they don't get their television <laughs> games or their right. dinner or whatever. Yeah. Everyone has to be entertained today. But you've entertained us for a great many years with your career, and a, a, a nice overview of it all is uh, part of your book, uh, Thinking Big. Yes, which is it's uh, my philosophy available. of life. Think mm -hmm. big, dream big dreams, mm -hmm. know that... There's a man upstairs that's saying, once you think of it, you better, you know it's going to happen. I have a saying that I give to the youngsters. Whatever you vividly imagine, ardently desire, sincerely believe, and enthusiastically act upon must inevitably come to pass. And it's true. It certainly is. Thanks, Dick Beals, for uh, spending some time with us today. We really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for asking it. me. And thanks for a great career. Thank you, sir, very much. Not at all.